All right, so page seven and this unit is called Empires Come and Empires Go. So last week when we talked about the beginning of the timeline, we talked about the fact that God created everything. And Adam and Eve were in a garden. And the garden, it says in the Bible, was planted between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And then there was the Cush, which isn't labeled here, and the Pishon River. And those were the rivers that were created by God. They were just when he caused it to rain and everything. So that's where he said he planted a garden right in here. And we now call that the Kirtle, Kirtle Press, Crescent, the Fertile Crescent. <laughs> so this is um, part of what the, the area that we're gonna talk a little bit about, but a lot of the Bible happened in here. Um, here's Jerusalem. And the Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea is over here. Babylon is here. The, the Hittites and the Mediterranean Sea. Hey, buddy. Where are my glasses? <laughs> they were on my head. So in illustration two, um, well, I'll start with the beginning paragraph. Some people think that the Bible people, like the Israelites or any of the people, the Hittites and all of those, that they lived in cozy comfort, insulated from history of the surrounding nations, devoted themselves wholeheartedly to worship and service of God. That's not true. They lived among superpowers that were constantly at war with each other, and they worshiped a variety of gods, even though God said, don't worship other gods. Um, especially if they married somebody who wasn't from the children of Israel, and God warned about that. God said, you know, don't do that, because it's just going to confuse you. So in illustration two, this illustration here, nope, I've got people waiting to get in. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, Cindy. Will you have to let us in every time? You know, I tried to change that earlier and okay. it didn't work. So I'm okay. going to go back out and try to change it again. Okay. And maybe it's... I didn't know if it was something on my up, end. Well, when I set it up originally, maybe it, um, it won't let me change it now. So maybe I need to back out and reset it completely. Okay. New. So okay. I will send out a new address if that's the case. Okay, perfect. Okay. So we're talking about this page. We're going to try to get through by 630 so that anybody that wants to can go to the council meeting. Hi, Cindy. Hi. You look fine. <laughs> I'll have a hair sticking straight up. <laughs> so we're talking about the Tigris and the Euphrates being in the center of a lot of big superpowers, as well as Israel over here, where Jerusalem is that the Israelites lived among a whole bunch of very powerful nations. And the title of this unit on page seven is Empires Come and Go. And in illustration two, it depicts what might be termed as an astronaut's view of the Mediterranean world in which the biblical narrative unfolds. The major players in that narrative, 
which is in the Mediterranean. The name Mediterranean comes from two Latin words that mean in the middle of land. So Mediterranean. <laughs> the land of Canaan, which is the white circle here, is located at the center stage. The Israelites who settled in Canaan were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. And then David captured Jerusalem and made it his capital. So this is in the center of a whole bunch. And I kept looking at this saying, it looks so weird because it should be this way. Because <laughs> here's Italy and here's Africa down here. But remember I said that the illustrator was from Australia? <laughs> uh, yeah. So she's turned it and is looking at it from like this perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she's looking at it from the south, <laughs> sideways. It said there were usually tensions and unhappy relations between the Israelites and Syria. Hmm, that's gone on for a long time. Good relations prevailed between the Israelites and the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were seafaring people. The Israelites were not. The Phoenicians played an important role in international trading ventures with the Israelites, and the Israelites needed access to their seafaring skills and services. So that was a really a uh, give and take kind of relationship with the Phoenicians. I'm looking to see where the Phoenicians are. Oh, here. Phoenicia is right here next to Jerusalem, right along the Mediterranean. The region between the Tigris and the Euphrates River is known as Mesopotamia, a name derived from two Greek words meaning between rivers. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians established successive empires in Mesopotamia. So Babylonia, Babylonia, is here, Persia is here. Syria is up here. And it says, the Babylonians conquered Assyrian or Nineveh in 612 BC and Cyrus, the Persian gave, gained control of Medi Medea in 550 BC. So in BC, we go down in numbers as we get closer to Christ's birth. And Medea and Persia gained control of or conquered Babylon in 539 BC. Then the Greeks under Alexander the Great ravaged Persepolis, a major Persian city, capital city in 330 BC. In 40 to 37 BC, the Parthians, which are not shown, to the northeast of Medea, so they are this way. So they helped Antigonus, a descendant of the Jewish rulers, gain control of Judea and Jerusalem and block Rome's land bridge to Egypt. So they came across here and Rome is here in Italy. So Rome would have come down here and I don't know if you can see it. 
Rome would have come down here and across the land bridge, which is Israel, but it was ruled by the people who took it over and they blocked Rome from coming across here to Egypt, where Africa is. <laughs> A lot of stuff going on in 500 years. The Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and the Romans consistently cast covetous eyes on Egypt, whose fertile mm -hmm. Nile Valley was the breadbasket of the ancient Mediterranean world. And when these ancient superpowers set out to plunder Egypt's resources, they naturally marched right through Canaan along the way. The Mesopotamian nations could not follow a direct route to Egypt, but had to travel between the rivers and down the Mediterranean coast to ensure access to food and water. Because here is that horrible Saudi Arabian desert down in here. So they couldn't go across there. There was no food or water. So they had to come here and follow the rivers. They had to come up the rivers and around and over to Egypt. So Egypt or er, Israel was constantly being traveled through and marched through and plundered. The Egyptians were aware of the ambitions and needs of their northern neighbors, and to discourage invasions by them, the Egyptians built a series of fortresses along the Mediterranean coast. The northernmost of these was located at Carchemish, which enabled the Egyptians to block the advance of Mesopotamian nations and discourage the empire building dreams of the Southern European powers. So Italy, anything over here in Europe, Turkey, on down, all these nations down here that were big superpowers, they were blocked here by an Egyptian fortress or wars. Because the nations believed that their gods led them into battle and gave them their victories, they usually placed symbols of the gods of conquered nations in their shrines. And the symbols of their gods in the shrines of those who they conquered. So they removed the gods that they conquered and put their symbols in those shrines and then took the others and because they were conquered. Um, in Second Kings, All right, the first, um, up here at the top, the second paragraph, it talks about Jerusalem. David captured Jerusalem and made it his capital. And that's in 2 Samuel 5, verse 6 through 10. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will, re will turn you back. Thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David had said on that day, whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, those whom David hates. Therefore, it is said, 
The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord. The God of hosts was with him. And Jesus in Matthew, in chapter 21, verse 14, it says that Jesus healed the blind and the lame. And he said they should come into the house. The next time we come across scripture is down in the second to the last paragraph on this page, and it's talking about the gods of conquered nations and um, placing symbols in their shrines. And that's in 1 Samuel, that's referred to, and it's five. First Samuel's longer than I thought. <laughs> okay. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and placed it beside Dagon. So 1 Samuel is way before David. And the Ark of God is the same Ark of the Covenant that we read about in Genesis or in Exodus when Moses talks with God and God says, put a, put a tent, put the Ark in a tent. And that's where I will dwell. And the Ark of the Covenant is what um, God told Moses to build and to design it. And there's angels on each end and there's all kinds of things. And that Ark is what the Philistines captured and took it to the Temple of Dagon. And then in Second Kings, Twenty-three, four, and five. Okay, the king commanded the high priest Hilkiah, the priests of the second order, and the guardians of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah and for all the hosts of heaven. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. He disposed the idolatrous priest, deposed the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. There were two groups of priests that they did this with. Those also who made offerings to Baal, to the sun, the moon, the constellations, and all the host of heavens. So it talks about the sun, the moon, the constellations, and the hosts of heaven. The last paragraph is on occasion, God declared that he would use other nations such as Assyria and Babylon to discipline his own rebellious people. And for that, we can look in Isaiah. Do you remember who the famous person is in Babylon? There's a whole book about him. He was part of the Israelites that were taken out of Israel 
because at that point it was just the southern kingdom that David was ruling over. And the Babylonians came and took all of those people and took them around through the Fertile Crescent and into Babylon. And they were there for, they were exiled there for years. And Daniel was one of the prophets. The Daniel in the lion's den and the guys, the three guys in the furnace when Jesus came and was in the furnace with them. So Isaiah 10, 5 says, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the club in their hands is my fury. And then in Jeremiah, I think I'm going to mark these for next week. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 6. It says, now I have given all these lands into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him even the wild animals of the field to serve him all the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes and then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave so he gave all of the israelites into the hands of the babylonians There are many, many things in our Bible prior to all of this. I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. Um, the land of Canaan, Abraham went from Haran, which is north of Israel or the land of Canaan. And God said, go down into that land. It's a promised land and I'm gonna give you that land, you and all your descendants. Your descendants will be as many as the stars. And remember, Abraham and Sarah didn't have any children. And they grew really old until God finally gave them Isaac. So any comments or questions on this part? Everybody's muted. <laughs> All right, I have questions. You can unmute yourself now. <laughs> So in order to understand the Bible's big story, which is what we're starting out with, we're looking at the big perspective of the earth and all these nations, the powerful ones, the weaker ones, the little troop of a million people that God brought out of Egypt across the Sinai and up into Israel and gave them back the land of Canaan, but they had to take it back. Remember, they ruined the city of um, just inside Jericho. They marched around the walls until they fell down. So the people, and God said, when you take a city, don't keep any of the spoils. Don't keep any, of the, don't marry the people. Um, and of course, they were human, so they did. <laughs> and they took some of the people with them. Rahab was in um, one of the first cities and she was a prostitute, supposedly. 
And those spies went in and she helped them. She hid them from the guards. And then when the Israelite people came and took the city, they brought her along with them. And she ended up marrying into that family. And she's one of the ancestors of Jesus. She's in his direct bloodline. But hundreds of years before Jesus was born. When I get to studying this stuff, it kind of makes me stop and think the United States is only 200 and some years old. <laughs> and we look at this and go, whoa, what are we in for? <laughs> so in the illustration um, that we were looking at in the other book, this book, this illustration, If we refer to that in the accompanying notes, make yourself familiar with the location of the countries that we talked about. The Hittites lived in what we call today Turkey. So right here's Turkey. And there are no Hittites anymore, supposedly. So we shouldn't tell ethnic jokes, but it's okay to tell an ethnic joke about a Hittite because there aren't any. <laughs> Not that anybody will identify with them. <laughs> Many people believe that the Old Testament narrative is merely about heroes and good people who are waiting anxiously for God to send a savior from sin. However, those who undertake a journey through the scriptural storyline using the biblical roadmap laid out in See Through the Scriptures discover that the Bible's big story is a complex and challenging one. The illustration below on this page depicts a gavel symbolizing God's judgment, descending like a hammer on what some refer to as the promised land. Can you see that? I'm on page three of the workbook. So there's the hammer coming down. According to the following passages, whom would God use to discipline his people in that promised land? We just read it. Does anybody remember? Is that Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> yeah. So that would be the Babylonians? Yes. Okay. And then the Jeremiah one. This, um, this is a longer read. In Jeremiah, it's, we read the beginning of it. Now I've given all these lands into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. All the nations will serve him until the great kings make him their slave. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, then I will punish that nation with a sword, with famine, and with pestilence, says the Lord, until I have completed its destruction by his hand. You, therefore, must not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers. Who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they are prophesying a lie to you with the result that you will be removed far from your land. I will drive you out and you will perish. But any nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will leave on its own land, says the Lord, to till it and live there. 
And God did take the people back to Israel. It was later, probably after a couple of generations went by. So, let's have a prayer now. And then let's talk about the timeline for a few minutes. Does that sound okay? Okay, good. Let's pray. Almighty, gracious, patient, and loving God, the story you reveal to us in your word is big and complex. Please empower us to understand it so that we might better understand the mission of your son, Jesus the Messiah, to your Old Testament people, and to us today. We thank you that you know, love, and forgive each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So do you all have your timeline there? Last week, we talked about how this first section, and this is the part that I'm going to talk about again today. So we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. This first section talks about how the people went from very few people to a lot of people, and how at the beginning of Genesis, we talk about a lot of years, millions of years, and we don't know the timeline. And we hear stories and more stories. And then finally, we begin with the story of Abraham. So the time and the creation starts to narrow its focus. The focus uh -huh. on, on our world gets narrower and narrower in the Bible. And then we start just following the children of Israel. Underneath, where it's labeled one through five, in one, that symbol, the circle with the arrows going out is the symbol for God. And the two people in number one, they're symbols of Adam and Eve, the first people. And the reason they have their arms raised is they're praising God. And that's how they were created. They were created to praise and love and thank God because God did everything for them in the beginning. God does everything for us now. <laughs> but the people in the beginning were created from out of love and the grace that God gives to each one of us. So underneath it says, Genesis 1, 1, 2, through 2, 4, 1 through 2, 4. In its teaching graphic, the Crossways International uses a circle with four protruding arrows as the symbol for God. Beneath it, and the circle means God is one, Without beginning or end, protruding arrows means God acts in love, which always goes out from God. And beneath it are reminders that God created the universe, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Trees, birds, animals, streams, fish, people who were to know and praise God. Four major narratives followed after that. By knowing and knowing God, it always, I don't know, I just get overwhelmed thinking about God walking around in the garden. I can't imagine. I mean, they were on a first name basis with God. <laughs> and they still disobeyed him. <laughs> so in two, you see the... Um, lightning 
the bolt of lightning in there. Humanity's sin fragments the relation between God and humanity and between the male and the female. So in that first narrative, we're talking about Adam and Eve. The serpent comes between Adam and Eve and causes a rip in the universe <laughs> between God and the humans that he created. And then sin or the rip in the universe divided Adam and Eve. So they didn't have that perfect relationship. I mean, I always said, did he tell her that she wasn't supposed to eat? Because God told Adam before he created Eve. Hopefully he told her, that's the tree we're not supposed to eat of. <laughs> but I'm how guessing. Come Adam, how come Adam didn't pipe up and say, hey, we're not supposed to be eating that? Yeah, right. I mean, she offered it to him. He took it. Right. And then um, the second picture, the flame at the top, um, humanity's sins fragment the relation between God and humanity. That's number two. Number three, Cain's sacrifice is rejected. Abel's is accepted. Cain kills Abel and family relations are fragmented. So that's the second part in Genesis 4 and 5. It's where Cain um, brings an offering to God and God rejects it. And Abel brings an offering to God, the first fruits of his labors. And God accepts it and loves it, and Cain gets jealous and kills Abel. And that, again, splits the relationship between God and human. In 4, which is in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it describes the divine beings being sexually intimate with earthly women. Cosmic chaos results. And God puts an end to creation one through a flood and commands Noah to build a large ark to preserve human and animal life and makes a new beginning to creation and history through Noah and his family. And that's in Genesis 6, verses 5 through Genesis 9, verse 29. So it's the whole generation, everything that happens with Noah is in that part. The 40 days and 40 nights, 40 is a number that we see throughout the Bible. And it's, um, it's a number like, haven't I told you a thousand times not to do that? It's, it's um, a lot of theologians call it um, it's a biblical number. Four is representing the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west, even though it's not square. <laughs> One of my kids said, but the earth is round, Mom. There's not four corners. <laughs> um, so that times 10 is 40. 10 is a perfect number, a number of completion. So a lot of times when you see 40 days, Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. The wilderness is an earthly thing. And it completed Jesus' time in the wilderness. And then he came out and was ready to begin his ministry. So... I didn't know they had cars back then, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. <laughs> so um, that began the 40 days of his fasting and the devil tempting him while he was there. And it was sort of a, okay, now you're ready to do your ministry and this is what's going to happen. 
we think he was about 30 years old, 30 being a triune number and a number of completion, three times 10, 30. Um, a lot of people felt that men were ready to begin um, married life and ministry and all of that at the age of 30. 12 is another biblical number. We had 12 apostles. Jesus was 12 years old when he went. Um, so you see some of those numbers get repeated over and over. We think Jesus was probably about 12 years old. <laughs> so, um, so the 40 days and 40 nights of rain happened. And then God gets really detailed in the building of the ark. You know, use gopher wood and make it this long and this high and measure it with your arm. This is a cubit from your arm. So that's pretty cool. So God made a new beginning to creation. He didn't destroy the earth and he kept humanity alive through Noah and his wife and then Ham, Shem, and Japheth, his sons, and their wives. So they went on to have more family. Number five is the people begin to build a tower to reach heaven to make a name for themselves and to avoid being scattered. And when God halts the project by confusing their languages, humanity is fragmented and scattered. So we know there was a lot of people on the earth by then. So it was probably several thousand years between Noah and them getting together to build this tower and they felt if they could build a huge tower and get above the clouds that they could become like God and God didn't want them to succeed at that so he confused their languages and scattered them it's possible that that happened before the Pangea where the continents divided. Myra, you're saying something, but you're muted. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm just repeating what you say. I'm talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> okay, you can mute yourself again, I guess. <laughs> My husband's mowing the lawn. It's very noisy, so I want to stay muted. Okay. So if that's the case, then once again, science and God's word can be matched. We have no reason to argue with what the Bible says and say that it can't be true because science has proved it wrong. It's not that science is brand new and we're discovering things that God didn't know. So if that's the case, if by some chance the, the earth was all in one spot, the ground was all in one spot, when the flood happened, it probably caused some waters to go between the mountains and all over. But then at some point, or at many points, the Pangea began to happen and continents moved. Dinosaurs died. People were on different parts of the earth. Native Americans and Native Russians and Native <laughs> Hittites. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the Hittites. <laughs> so comments, questions? This is, this is the huge part of the narrative. It's kind of overwhelming, it's big. And um, 
the study is trying to give us the big picture and then we're going to come down into a smaller picture and in the next couple of units some of the things that we just talked about on the timeline are going to um, be talked about so we're going to talk about the books of the bible um, we're going to talk about humanity and <laughs> what we're like <laughs> so it's going to get um, a little more detailed and we're going to understand more and more um, what you know god promised us things and said please you know do this to adam and eve and they disobeyed and instead of zapping them and saying okay never mind i don't want people on the earth he just set them outside the garden and said go go be with the rest of the people and do right things and cain and abel still knew god because they offered sacrifices to god and then when cain killed abel god said oh my goodness here we go again and he took cain and he set him out into the world and said go find family I'll put a mark on you so you don't die because you're going to be different than everybody else. And um, then the third time, the people and the beings, the Nephilim and all of that stuff, the world was really confusing and we were doing awful things and God said, you know what, I'm done. And then Noah found favor in the eyes of God and God said, fine, I will just, um, I will just put you in an ark and I'll save you and I'll save all these animals and we'll start over. And Noah worshiped God and everything went really well until then people got kind of haughty again and decided they could be like God if they built a tower. So if we see a pattern here through all those thousands of years. God loves us and gives us grace and continues to love us and forgive us and continues to go back to the original of what he created or what God created. So, all right. We're at 624. Does anybody have anything in particular that we should pray for? Holly, how are you doing? I have an appointment tomorrow with my oncologist, so we'll see. Find out more? Yes. Okay, good. So we'll keep you in our prayers. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything? I don't know if any of the rest of you have heard that Roberta Hufford died. Myra knows that. <laughs> Myra was a good friend of hers. Um, Roberta and Dick have been have been inactive members because they've been homebound for a number of years. Um, but they continue to be connected to the chapel. Cindy, do you remember them? They were a lot more active when you and Dan started there, but you were just starting there. And then you know, they would come, but yeah. I'll ask Dan. He probably remember. <laughs> he probably does. They were an older couple, kind of quiet. Um, and now they've moved up to Midland to be with their kids. Mm -hmm. And she died last week. So mm -hmm. other than that, council meeting tonight. So we'll see <laughs> if we've got more to talk about. So all right, let's um, close in prayer. Lord God, as we continue through this week and the weeks to come, help us to gain more understanding of your gracious love, of your mm -hmm. forgiving love, and help us to remember that we don't have to earn that that it's a free gift to us and that you love watching us live. Help mm -hmm. us um, 
to care for one another like you care for us. Be with Hallie and her family as they learn more about what's coming up in the near future. Be with the Hubbard family as they um, begin a new normal for Dick as he's on his own now and for the rest of the family as they care for him and comfort one another. Be with each one of us as we move into the, these new times. Every week seems to bring a new wave of normal. Um, help us to find ways to comfort each other and to stay connected and to uplift one another. Um, the times get long and hard, Lord, and we know that you understand that. Just help us to know how we can help each other to stay um, close to you and to each other. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Is there anything else that you guys want me to try to do other than I'm going to try to make it so that you can enter the room <laughs> without asking, without being in a waiting room. I tried to do that earlier, but I think I might take down. I, when I signed up in the, originally, it gave me six weeks. It, it took it out to October 26th. And I'm wondering if I just need to shut that all down and start fresh with a new set of weeks. Well, and then, David, did you go down to the bottom and where it says, let the folks in before the host, there's a thing you can click on that says, let the participants in before the host. There's a participants thing and a security and a screen share. Is that it? No, when you, when you, when you set it up, like originally when you go to Zoom and set it up. Oh, yes. I, I went to settings today and tried to change all that stuff so that you could get in beforehand. Yeah. And then, like if, if there's a week that I can't be there, I can assign right. someone else to be the host and come and, you know, work through that week with you guys. Um, but it doesn't seem to have worked. Oh, okay. Because I think then tonight, I, go ahead, Susan. I don't think you have to go to settings. You can just go to your meeting and on the bottom of that page, you have options okay. as to what I, how I can set it. Right. Okay. So check that out. But you, you may have to. Um, well, you shouldn't have to totally uh, take that back because <laughs> I did totally re-download Zoom at one point in time. So you may have to. Yeah. Let's yeah, you should be happens. able to just go in and edit it. So I don't yeah. know why that didn't work. It looks like Donna is trying to come on. I know. I just noticed what she was coming on earlier. And then I, I, I clicked on her to come on. And then she never joined us. And just now it said she was waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> That's why I don't want to have to do that. Because I get to study in and it doesn't. We're still okay. new. We have I we know. have plenty of weeks. That's right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take off. I'm going to try yep. and um, do the council meeting too. Okay. So, good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, Myra.